Welcome to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Dominic Hardy. I'm Public Programs Officer in the Education and Public Programs Department, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here this afternoon as we inaugurate the sixth annual series of lectures given by François-Marc Gagnon, Chair of the Gale and Stephen Jaroslawski Institute for Studies in Canadian Art at Concordia University. In offering this series free of charge to the public, the Institute has always sought to promote a better understanding and appreciation of Canadian art history. With our important collection in this area, this is an objective with which we concur most wholeheartedly, and we thank the Institute for its continued collaboration. I'd like to take this opportunity to renew our thanks to Rosemary Jolie, the Institute Administrator, and to Dr. Lauren Lerner, Chair of the Department of Art History at Concordia University. I also would like to thank, as always, René Malot and Marie Gagnon, who offer invaluable support to all of the museum's cultural activities. In welcoming you, you today, I also want, knowing that many of you are friends of the museum in one way or another, I want to extend a special welcome to all of the students of Concordia University who are with us. We're entering an era in which the museum is becoming more and more accessible to everyone. And as students, you may be especially pleased to know that as of this month, the entire museum is open Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday evenings. And this is a permanent change. This includes all of our permanent collection areas, including the Canadian collection, which have in the past been closed during late opening hours. The museum is making a commitment to being a resource for Montrealers at the times you are most able to visit. So we look forward to welcoming you. You'll also see that we're open earlier on Saturdays and Sundays. Now, we're all gathered here to hear from François-Marc Gagnon, and it's my pleasant duty to present him to you. Usually, I do a nice long list of all his publications and exhibitions, but I wish to speak today briefly, because I, I know you want to hear from him, just as an art historian among other art historians. If you are passionate about the history of art in Canada, the history of Canadian art, you know that you will encounter Dr. Gagnon everywhere on your journey. He has helped transform the field of study, not only through his research, and I think of the sheer range from the earliest images of Canada at the time of Jacques Cartier to his definitive studies of Paul Emile Bordua and the Automatiste movement, but also through his commitment to the most engaging of teaching and writing practices, to the very value of learning. He has earned an honored place in our hearts, and ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to join me in welcoming our friend, François-Marc Gagnon. It's not the first time I hear Dominique speaking so nicely, but each time <laughs> I get a little bit emotional, I will come down by speaking to you. Uh, okay, so this year, ladies and gentlemen, the topics will be portrait in Canadian art. Uh, when I thought of this subject, I said, oh, this will be boring, it's a real challenge, how can I make it interesting and all that? You will see, I don't know if I succeeded, but it was certainly a kind of, uh, uh, challenge that I put to myself. You notice also that it's uh, after six years that I touched this subject. So today, what I want to do to start is to speak about self-portraits, uh, the, the problem of uh, how artists represent themselves. I thought this is promising because in a way it will be, uh, if you want a way to present uh, the artists that we will deal with during the whole series, and also because we suspect always in a self-portrait, maybe the artist will reveal something more personal about himself, more intimate, if you want. And uh, you will see that it's not exactly the case, but anyway, uh, that was uh, what you could start with as an hypothesis of, of work, you know, th that maybe we will find there a kind of something more personal about the artist himself. Uh, when you speak of self-portrait, the first... Uh, first thing, let's say, I have to get familiar with, uh, that come to mind, it is the problem of the mirror. Uh, and uh, I start with this painting by a very obscure painter, this Johannes Gump. We have no idea who he is. We know his name. Uh, he's probably from the uh, Netherlands. Uh, he's probably from the Low Countries. Uh, we know exactly the date of the picture because he, he gave us the clue. He wrote it on 
you see on the top there's a little a piece of paper there where his name is and 1646. But apart from this, we know nothing about him. But what is fascinating here, it is that he show you exactly how the self-portrait is made in a way. Uh, because what you see, it's him seen from the back, looking at a mirror on the left, and painting himself on the right on the canvas. Uh, so this is exactly the, the kind of setting in which the uh, self-portrait is made. You see, you have a mirror, and you have your canvas, and you have to look at yourself, and you see, he, he almost tell you, you say, I don't lie too much. Uh, the picture looks like the one in the mirror, and of course, we have no way to check on him because we see him only from the back. And also the other thing that I was asking myself, did he need another mirror, you know, to see himself from the back like this? See? And are we going uh, like a, a recession to in the infinite like this? But anyway, maybe it's easier to imagine what he will be uh, seen from the back than in front like this. Huh? So this is the, the, first, uh, uh, the first constatation, if you want, that this implication of the self-portrait with the mirror or any substitute to the mirror. Of course, with modern artists, you will see that very often photographs play the role of the mirror. Uh, if we try to put it in a, in a context, let's say, of more psychological or even psychoanalytical, I, would, I thought of this. I said, when, when you think of uh, your picture in a mirror, I said, my God, this is very close to what Jacques Lacan, uh, the famous... Uh, psychoanalyst, uh, Freudian, but also a kind of dissident to Freudism, uh, French uh, psychoanalyst said about what he called the mirror stage. Uh, apparently, when kids are between eight months to 18 months, there's a period where they recognize themselves in a mirror. And they suddenly realize that the mirror is them. And uh, this observation, of course, have been done much before Lacan. Already you have it in Darwin, for instance. Uh, Darwin, in his book on the uh, expression of, uh, of the face and all that, have uh, on emotion, uh, his book on how uh, emotion are translated in, in the face, have already uh, taken note of that, that kids at a certain age become to recognize themselves in the mirror. In the French tradition, let's say that Lacan would have known better, uh, you have Henri Vallon, W-A-L-L-O-N, uh, uh, who is a psychologist who speak at, at length about this phenomenon in, the, in his book, Le, La formation du caractère chez l'enfant, uh, the, the, the formation of a character in the child, and uh, published, I think, in 1934 or something. And uh, there, what, is inter what Vallon is interested in, it is to know exactly when the concept of its own body is discovered by the child. Uh, when did the, the child realize that the image is there is his own body? Uh, so what Wallon was interested in, in fact, it is the elaboration of not only of the self-image, if you want, but also of the notion of, uh, of being, this is me. Uh, and uh, he's interested also to know when this happened and is it possible that it's a typical human trait, let's say, that uh, only human could uh, suddenly, like this, recognize themselves in a mirror. Uh, the little girl who is here is called Rosie. Uh, I don't know her personally, but I, I, <laughs> I find her in a book. Uh, it's interesting what she did. She, she looked at herself in the mirror, and she realized it was her, and then she checked. She went back, and she took this scarf that you see there in black and white, and came back to the mirror to, to, to check if the scarf will be there, too. Uh, so it, it's really like she make really, a, a, I would say, a, a little display to, to make us realize, no, no, that this is real. It's not just a, 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 an impression we have. She's really uh, recognizing herself in the mirror. If you think of uh, animals, uh, like birds, for instance, habitually, when you put a mirror in front of them and they see their image, they become aggressive right away. That means they don't think it's, it's them, they think it's another bird. Uh, and habitually, if it's another male bird, also uh, right away, she, uh, this plover here will attack the, it's a ringed plover, he will attack the other one. Uh, the only animal apparently who can do something like the human are the chimps. Uh, so I, I, was <laughs> I was very happy to find these, these, 
very demonstrative picture, especially the one in, in the bottom on the right, uh, where evidently uh, the chimp seems to enjoy his own uh, image. And also you see in the others, the, he's checking about his face. Huh? He make, for instance, uh, he will open his mouth and he will check that the, the image also do the same. Then he will touch his eyebrows or he, he will put, uh, which is not nice, of course, he will put his, <laughs> his finger in his nose and things like that. But, but y y you see that there is a kind of uh, relationship there with uh, self-image. Huh? So only in a higher uh, level of primates, you see, you will find this type of behavior. Uh, the, all the rest, all the other animals will, will not do it like this. The other thing was characteristic of a chimp with their image, the moment they realize that what is in the mirror is just an image, they got disinterested with it. They don't, they don't play endlessly with that. They do it at the beginning, they are intrigued and all that, they check, and then when it's over, they don't pay attention. You could leave the mirror in their cage, let's say, and they will not play with it uh, any, any time which is very different, of course, with, with human kids. Uh, what happened with, with human kids, it's, uh, I wanted to illustrate it with a, a not famous painting, but uh, let's see, it's very clear for my demonstration. It is done by Jacques Auguste Catherine Pajot, or whatever he is, I don't know. It's a f uh, beginning of, uh, of 19th century, let's see, in terms of dates, I think. Uh, well, more or less. Anyway, and the, La famille Pajou, okay, uh, so he make, make uh, the mother, the, and, and, but what's interesting, it is the little kid there looking at his image in the mirror and trying to reach it in a way, huh? he touch it, he touch the surface of the mirror. And then you will see the difference of what I was explaining about Wallon before and what Lacan says in that. Wallon, you remember I said, is interested by the appearance of the notion of own body. Uh, when this notion start to be in the mind of the child. For Lacan, this is not interesting. What Lacan is interested in, it is the behavior of the kids in front of his mirror image. He says, look how excited he is. Why he come always to the image and, and he's not tired by it. He, and he try uh, to change position, he try to make faces and things like that. And, and he giggle, he's happy, he's excited by the image. And then the theory is the following. It says, in fact, what is happening there, there's a kind of discrepancy between the lack of motricity of the kid. Uh, at this age, uh, he doesn't have control on his, on his arms. Uh, he, see, he, he, he moves and all that, but he cannot walk, let's say, he cannot really, uh, he, he's not in complete control of his uh, uh, motricity. Uh. Uh, on the other hand, also, the kind of self-perception that the baby could have is very piecemeal, I would say. Say, like, uh, okay, now I'm hungry, I shout, and I get uh, food. Now I'm wet, I shout, and I get uh, on the... So it's like a series of little uh, prise de conscience, awareness, if you want, that are, uh, uh, they are separated from one and the other. And suddenly, in the, in the mirror, what do you see? It's a hole. Uh, instead of being like this with lack of control uh, of his uh, movement on one hand, and also this kind of very piecemeal type of perception of himself, now he sees himself as a totality, as a whole. Uh, and that's why Lacan speaks of kind of identification with this image. Wow, this is great. This is what I want to be. Uh, this is what I will be. Uh, and, uh, and also, at the same time, what is uh, introduced in this type of experience is a certain lack of knowledge, or can we say unknowledge, méconnaissance, if you want. In French, will, uh, it will be méconnaissance. The uh, kind of lack of knowledge of himself. Uh, because, of course, there's a discrepancy between this image of all of people in control and all that, and what it is in reality, where he's still a baby, he's still not able to do whatever he wants. Uh. So in the image in the mirror, and this is, I think, the important point, you have a kind of illusion. You can have a kind of uh, irreality, a kind of uh, lie about what you are uh, when you look at yourself in the mirror, in a way. And this, of course, is a key for the self-portrait of my artist that we'll speak after, because you will see there's always this element of unknowledge uh, about themselves. Uh, the, another example, I think, uh, 
also uh, another famous, well, this is a, a more known painter, uh, George Romney, it's a kind of a great English painter of the end of the 18th century. And uh, he represents here Mrs. Russell or whatever with his child. But, but what is fantastic is, is the way the child is completely immersed in their own image. Uh, there's no place for others. Uh, the narcissism who is, who is uh, expressed here is also very aggressive to the others. Uh, it's me, myself, and I. Uh, you can see that there's no, no place for, for other kids there. Uh, because in a way, the image even of your self-image is something else in you. Uh, and it's like the others, in a way. Uh, it's outside there. And there's a kind of competition right away between my image and the image of, and the others, let's see, even if are not the images. Uh, and that's why very often in this uh, self-image, you, you have an element of aggressivity, and you will see it also in our self-portrait. When you think then now how this will be transposed these idea, let's see, how do we, we will transpose them in art and how will, uh, it would be a kind of tool if you want to understand what's happening in art. I thought that the, the best example was the series of little engravings that Rembrandt did. Uh, don't worry, I will speak of Canadian art soon, uh, but <laughs> I just want to put my things in context and after we'll go to Canadian example. Rembrandt did this, maybe hate of these little engravings like this, in which literally he's making face. Huh? It's him uh, with the wide eye, it's him uh, hungry, it's him uh, with open mouth, uh, looking a little bit stupid, and it's him scolding and all that. And uh, let's see a few more here, uh, uh, laughing, uh, he, he looks really uh, idiot, but right away on the right, you see that he could look m much more clever, much more interesting. Huh? And, and this image, in fact, is very close to what I was showing before with the kids. Huh? Like testing his own image and trying and being another, 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 like this endlessly. Huh? A little bit uh, like I'm everything. I'm, I could be everything. There was a lot of speculation about the meaning of that in Ram Ram. Uh, we were asking ourselves why he did that. And one of the hypotheses, of course, it is that he may have used some of these pictures to do others. Uh, for instance, here the representation of a beggar seems to uh, borrow uh, the same type of open mouth and weird looking, let's say, that he have in one of his pictures. But the fact that most of these faces are a little bit uh, 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 absurd in a way, huh? they are not really geared toward, uh, let's say, the expression of emotion of feelings, they are more just for the, uh, I think the, the, the right expression in English is to making face, uh, just making faces. You just try to, to see uh, wh what uh, each time a new challenge in each of this picture. And this is much closer to the mirror stage, of course. Uh, this idea of making faces in front of the mirror, this is exactly what the mirror stage is all about. Uh. And, uh, and I think we have a, a kind of confirmation of that in the same uh, period, and the same year even, that he made this little engraving, this is one of his self-portraits in which, of course, it's much more calm and subdued. Uh, he, he gave himself a kind of naive uh, air of somebody bewildered and, and in front of the world, but th that's it. Uh. And indeed, if you think of all the self-portraits of Rembrandt, and God knows there was many, most of them are difficult to penetrate, to to understand exactly, he's like neutral, he's like uh, in, in, I would say, in control of himself and he doesn't show uh, any special emotion more than the others. You, in fact, you have to wait at the very end of his life to find a Rembrandt uh, almost laughing and so at least smiling like here and uh, <coughs> self-portrait as a laughing philosopher. The laughing philosopher in, uh, in the tradition is Democritus. Uh, he's habitually opposed to Heraclitus, who was uh, somber and obscure and, uh, and uh, to tell the truth, very depressed man. And so the, at the time, they were opposing both. You see, uh, Democritus was uh, always laughing. Why? Because he, he was uh, critical of uh, his neighbors. Of, uh, he come from a, a, a town in, oh my God, how do you say it, Tras, 
I have no idea how do you say that in English. Well, it's somewhere in Greece, let's say, believe me. <laughs> and it, the town was called Abdira. And the citizen of Abdira had a bad reputation in the antiquity. They were supposed to be very stupid, the kind of new fee of, uh, of, the, <laughs> of the time. And uh, so Democritus was laughing at them all the time, and that's why they call him the, the, uh, the laughing philosopher. So it's possible that uh, uh, Rembrandt wanted to personify it or to, to see himself as Democritus, if you want. The other hypothesis is also we know, according to uh, the ancient author, that Xerxes, who is one of the first painters uh, of the tradition, uh, died from laughing at looking at his own picture, which is uh, a fantastic way to die, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> but I don't wish it on anybody. Anyway, so it's, it's what you see on the right. It's one of the students of Rembrandt, this uh, Aaron de Gelder, that, that tried to depict that. And maybe Rembrandt wanted to do this. If you look carefully on the top left of his picture, you see a profile of somebody there. And it could be a picture that make him laugh or something like that. The, I don't want to elaborate too much on this. But, but you see, if you, if you look at the oeuvre of Rembrandt, you have these these little experiments at, at, at the beginning, and then subdued, and just at the very end of his life, he come back to this idea of uh, showing directly emotion in a painting. Uh, now, okay, now we'll, we'll go to our Canadian stuff. And to start with, with Antoine Plamondon. Uh, Plamondon uh, is a Quebec of the 19th century. In this self-portrait, you would say 1882, uh, he's really at the end of his life. It's uh, probably one of the last painting he ever painted. And it's a self-portrait. He, he wanted to, to show himself uh, at his best, I would say. And uh, he was uh, active in Quebec City and mainly known as a portrait painter and also uh, trying to get all the commission he could get from uh, religious uh, religious organization, let's say churches or convent or whatever. And he, he was very uh, tough on the market around Quebec. He was the one who, who get all the contract and he saw to it. Uh, uh, you could see in the newspaper of the time articles written by him where he attacked everybody uh, that, uh, that is not called Plamodo. Any painter <laughs> who is there is bad and things like that, and he's very vicious and all that. So he was very conscious of that. Now, of course, he wants to present himself as an old man, uh, very wise, and, uh, and you see that uh, his palette and his painting are like floating in midair in front of him, but one thing is uh, striking, he doesn't have any hands, uh, and he just stands like this, uh, behind this, as if he wanted to, to tell us, well, this is over for me and all that. The, uh, we know uh, since recently that here, the mirror, let's say, was a photograph. Uh, so I was speaking before that uh, you cannot have a self-portrait without a mirror, but or a substitute to the mirror. In this case, we know that he used this photograph of himself done by a photographer of Quebec. It's called Lee Vernois. I put his name on, on the bottom there. And uh, also uh, with something written by him, Le Antoine Plamondon, Hage de, et cetera. Then he play on, on his age a little bit. He, he's, he's born like, uh, he, he gave one year more than, say, he, he, he aged himself, if you want. And in his picture, by speaking of 82 ans, huh, he aged himself of two years now. So, so if he'd made 10 pictures, I guess he will be 100. But uh, anyway, he, he, he played on that. He played on his, on his, uh, on his age, wanting to, to show himself older than he is, if you want. And also, if you compare the picture with the photograph, you have the impression in the picture that he's, uh, he's uh, more trim. Let's see, his beard is better shaped, uh, doesn't too, uh, too bushy like, like in a photo. And is, he doesn't have this kind of, uh, of West Coast, you see, all uh, crooked and all that. He's, he's, as if he have uh, really uh, not only play on his age, but also give himself a kind of long, uh, younger look. Uh, so, uh, and, and when you think of the, the type of career that Plamondon had all his life, I think this is the, the ultimate case of uh, a completely 
untrue picture of himself. Uh, he, he, he looks like a, a wise man, very in control and all that. In fact, he was vindicative, he was tough, he was insulting everybody. Not at all like, like you will imagine if you just like. So it's a good case of this hun knowledge of himself. Uh, this is the image you want to project of himself. It's not what he is. Uh, and we, we, uh, we have some documents around this picture, for instance, he published about the same time, a little bit later, let's say in, in three years after, uh, this little uh, uh, announcement where he says, well, le grand âge ayant obligé le soussigné à arrêter de peindre, you see, the, being so old, I cannot paint anymore, and I want to sell my, mm, all my pictures and everything, so anybody who's interested, I have also a lot of uh, books on art, and it could start a new school, and uh, see, he tried to he make, it's a little announcement in the newspaper of the time, where he, he, he is telling us more or less, this is over for me, I may live more, but now I am achieve what I wanted to do, and that's it. But when you, you see him, uh, we have other photo of him, some of them, I think, and this is one that was interesting also. This has been taken much before, that the one that uh, Livernois, that, that again, by another of these Livernois guys. Uh, they had the, a photo studio in Quebec at the time, and they, they were very active also, and also in competition with painters. Uh, this is one of the problem when photos start, uh, especially making portraits like this, they are in competition with a painter. But okay, also Plamondon here looks more, I would say, like the, the man I described to you, like tough guy and, and very uh, conscious of his importance and very uh, also uh, uh, say fighting for his turf, I would say, in Quebec. Uh, and we have even a self-portrait of him when he was a student in Paris with a bad mouth. Uh, he's, uh, he, he, looks <laughs> he doesn't look sympathetic. Uh, uh, he was never married, I don't know why, <laughs> after what I said. And uh, he, he was a, a kind of a bachelor all his life like this and uh, very always uh, tough on everybody. But, but it's, a, it's a good case, this type of idealization, let's say, that uh, in the self-image of an artist, when we know a little bit more about their real character and, and their, and their uh, appearance. Uh, in the case of Cornelius Krigoff, this is a surprising self-portrait. We don't know much about uh, Krigoff. Uh, this guy didn't write, didn't sh uh, left any written documents about him. We know more or less his career, uh, and he had also some little uh, advertisement like the one I show you before in newspaper, but with this you cannot build a, say a kind of picture of what he is. Uh, what we know through his picture, he, he had uh, certainly a sense of humor because uh, he was uh, making fun of uh, his subject matter to very often, especially a French Canadian apparently. Mind you, his wife was French Canadian, so I'm not sure that he, he was always uh, mocking uh, at French Canadian, but he, he had the, the scene in which, uh, you know, some of the picture of Krigoff, I guess, in which uh, you see uh, uh, merry people uh, getting drunk and all that, and it, it's, a, it's a kind of merry uh, world, I would say, Krigoff. But when you look at his self-portrait, he doesn't look so uh, uh, merry, no, the less I can say. And even he look aggressive also. I think this is, this is interesting, this kind of, uh, uh, aggressivity that is v uh, is uh, transmitted through uh, this picture, uh, and like I mentioned before, this narcissism uh, implied in the self-portrait also could express certain aspect of aggressivity. This is me and not another. Uh, this is me excluding others, uh, and and you you have the this ambiguity here, and it's surprising because of after all. What we know of, of Krigov seems to be a rather a good fellow, uh, enjoying good life, drinking, uh, going to hunt with buddies and things like that. See, not at all uh, what this picture uh, seems to convey. Uh, uh, we have many photos of Krigov, and again, it's, he looks always a little bit sad and depressed. He's not at all uh, what we should expect from his painting. Uh, these two pictures, uh, a little bit ridiculous, both of them, because they are ev evidently uh, organized, uh, mounted. Imagine uh, Krigoff with his huge coat, uh, what we call a, in French Canadian, we call it a capot de chat. Uh, uh, this is a chat, c'est le chat sauvage, of course, it's the, uh, 
the bobcat, I think. <laughs> and, and so he's inside with a balustrade like that and a big curtain, like as if, say, and his uh, hat and all that, and he doesn't seem too happy. He have even this kind of, uh, of uh, slash uh, around the, the they all, all the trapping, let's say, of a man uh, from outside, I would say, but, but Lee Vernois could not bring his camera outside. So he says, okay, stay there, and I have my studio here. I will, show, I will take a photo of you. And then in the other one, it's a little bit the same trick. It's the same place. I, look at the, the, the floor in, in both images. Huh? We are in the same, uh, probably two, two meters from, from the other one, very close. But you say, okay, bring your easel, bring your box uh, of color. You put it on the floor or near him. And uh, he said, do you have some to something who looks artist? He says, I have a guitar. Okay, bring it also. The guitar is on the right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, try to make believe the, the public that you are painting. Uh, and of course, he's not painting. He, there's nothing on his canvas. Uh, his, his brush is dry, I'm sure, and all that. And again, he looks a little bit like uh, the, the press of a not to. The, mind you, these two photos have been taken maybe like 10 or 15 years after the picture. So maybe you could say, well, in the meantime, he got depressed, I don't know. But here, here, here is a picture of him who is exactly contemporary to the, to the picture. I, uh, a photo of him, uh, he is the one on the right, uh, completely at the right. Uh, it's, of course, a curling club. Uh, and that's why these guys seem so happy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> curling is a terrible... <laughs> I don't like curly. <laughs> and, uh, and that's explained also the, the broom uh, in the hand of, uh, say, because they go like this. And then the two rocks are on the floor. Uh, the, yeah, they have all, it's the curling club of, of Quebec. But, but that's it. Krigoff is among them, and, he, he's, uh, and maybe his face is a little bit closer to the one we saw in the painting, but not, not completely. Uh. And uh, he have also sometimes include himself in one of his paintings. Uh, like this one, who is a kind of challenge, I would say, because he represents himself there with two hunters and an Indian guide who have just killed the moose uh, that you see in the middle and with a uh, kind of sunset behind. And by definition, of course, a sunset, something is very hard to paint because it changes all the time and you have to be uh, quite fast to, to know the things as, it, as, as they are. I show you a detail of that, and you will recognize him more. Huh? You see, he's there with his uh, uh, folio like this, uh, showing how serious he is. You see, he goes even in the middle of uh, of winter, and uh, he negotiates with these hunters. Uh, Can I make your picture and all that? So this is the image you want to give, of course, of a serious artist, committed, not afraid of uh, of the seasons and things like that. And he goes. Uh, uh, he showed that. But mind you, the two men who are there are two of his close friends. Uh, one is a banker and the other is a, 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 a director of an auction house. So uh, it was called Martin. And this is his buddy, is uh, Monsieur Bondon. And the Indian guy who is with a knife, of course, says, should we start to, uh, to cut the meat? And it's, uh, of course, a female moose. Uh, there's no uh, big... Uh, uh, horn and uh, there will be no trophy with this one. Uh, but the, the, the idea that Krigoff include himself in a picture like this is also, I would say this is his professional side. Uh, that's what he wants us to, to believe, that he is committed to this type of picture that are difficult to do, but he's there and he can uh, uh, operate, I would say, in any type of climate, in any type of situation. Another case of... Uh, about the same period, it is uh, a man who was for, for a while, let's see, a, a student of Plamondon, and but young, let's say of a little bit younger generation, he, he touched almost our century. It's Théophile Hamel, huh? and here he, he made a self portrait of himself like a young man with also uh, his. Uh, a drawing pad and a pencil in his hand, but he's situated himself in a kind of beautiful landscape behind him. This is strange because Hamel never painted in landscape. Uh, <laughs> if, if seeing this picture, you say, oh boy, this is great. This guy will make the landscape. No, no, no. no. He was painting portrait, essentially, and also religious picture. Uh, and, uh, and he never touched the, the landscape as such. But I think there he tried to follow 
a fashion, let's say, of, uh, that you will find many examples of that in uh, English art in particular, where the artist is represented in harmony with nature. Uh, and, and then the nature could be very conventional like here. Don't try to find where is it in Quebec and all that, it's nowhere. Uh, it's just uh, a, a way to represent, uh, let's say, a whoops, qu'est-ce que je fais? Yeah, I will leave that because this is probably the type of model he had in hand. Uh, he had in his head. Uh, this is a, a, a picture done in England by um, a kind of famous portraitist also, uh, right of Derby. And it is the representation of a poet of his, of his friend who is called Booth Bai. And uh, he represents him like uh, Amel, uh, completely immersed in nature, except that the nature seems more real here, more more genuine than in the Hamel picture. Huh? And uh, also the book he have in his hands is a Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, book uh, about, of course, and you saw that Rousseau as a philosopher was very much for nature, for going back to nature and all that. I, I, even in his famous book about uh, education of children, this was his motto, you see, try not to uh, discipline too much the child, let him be free and all that. See, uh, Rousseau c'est vraiment le, le philosophe de la nature. Huh? Alors, so, uh, Boudba is there uh, lying almost like a courtesan, I would say. It's very <laughs> weird that uh, a portrait of a man will be presented like this, lying and uh, showing himself like this with, with, uh, with his gloves and all that. Uh, anyway, yeah, I love this picture. <laughs> <It's a laughs> Because it's so it's so counter, let's say uh, the the con it's so counter the the fashion of the time. Uh, in that sense, Amel is much more subdued. Uh, he presents himself standing in front of the landscape. He doesn't see himself immersed like this in the landscape. But it's probably the type of model he have in ha in his head that he, what he want to convey. Uh, this idea that a good painter is somebody who is inside of uh, nature who have. Uh, uh, a kind of feeling for it and can reproduce it, can imitate it perfectly. We have another picture of Amel who is more, let's say, uh, uh, closer to the truth probably. It's him in his studio uh, with uh, three paintings, let's say, and the, uh, s let's say, the historian of the uh, Museum of Quebec have think, have discovered the subject matter of, s of these paintings. You see uh, behind him on the wall, between him and his easel, you have the portrait of this uh, Melchior de Salaberry, uh, who is one officer, let's say, probably who commissioned him to make his portrait. And on the right, behind his back, but it's hard to see on this reproduction, it is this uh, representation of the typhus uh, with uh, the gray nuns trying to heal people uh, that is there. And finally, the painting is painting, it's the painting we see. Uh, you see the oval shape, and uh, so it, it is as if he represents himself painting a painting uh, of himself, uh, li like uh, closing the circle like this. And uh, uh, this, this idea of representing uh, yourself is the first example of that as a painter, uh, with your painting inside of your self-portrait, this is also a kind of way to show uh, your profession, uh, to show what you want to convey to the public. Uh, and uh, the, the, the major example of that, I would say, is uh, come from, from a long, long tradition, but I thought of, of Poussin's picture, for instance, of himself. Poussin uh, was asked by his friend Chanteloup to make a self-portrait of himself, and he didn't want to do because he says, it's, it's since so many years I don't make any portrait. I'm not at ease with this, and I, why you ask me that? And finally, he decided to do it. So he put himself in front of his own painting. Most of them are uh, turned back to us, but there's one on the left who shows some subject matter. And I give you a detail of it on the right. And you see that it's a woman with a kind of crown, and in the crown you have an eye. Yeah. And then you see that somebody is holding her on each side. You see hands reaching her from the bottom of the picture. And it's probably um, um, a depiction of painting itself uh, that uh, Poussin likes so much. And so you represent her like a woman with one eye because the eye is it's the 
by, a, you see, the sense by which you see nature and all that, and also this gesture of love, of course, uh, that uh, is reaching her. It's a possible interpretation of this detail, and it's the only one that he shows. Uh, the, rest, the rest of the painting are obscure. But this idea of presenting the painter with uh, some uh, of his production, I think, I is interesting. It's one of the, mm, the uh, subject matter that you find often. But habitually, the self-portraits are much more discreet than that. Uh, they don't show you. For instance, here, uh, Marcorel de Foy, Suzor Côté, what a name. Huh? And uh, the, if you read the, the catalog of uh, my friend Laurier Lacroix on uh, Suzor Côté, he have a whole chapter describing the name. It's complicated. It's uh, Marcorel. It's already uh, Marcorelius. It's uh, one of the emperor. And uh, the Foy, I don't remember, Suzor is the name of his, uh, of his mother, Cote. He, uh, Cote in French, uh, in French Canadian, I have a, uh, an accent circonflex, kind of. Uh, and here uh, it went, went out, it, it makes better Suzor Cote. Uh, it, it sounds better in France, especially. And the, okay, so he make, he make himself like this. You see that the picture is taken as if from below. Uh, and it gave him a kind of authority like this. And he have a cigarette in his mouth, uh, meaning that he's uh, a little bit bohemian. He doesn't have a tie and things like that. And uh, as if he wants to show himself as the, the young uh, artist, uh, a little bit rebellious, and uh, also very sure of himself. And it's a pastel. It's a very well controlled. And I, I had the, the idea of... Uh, confronting him with, with a portrait done by another paint, uh, another sculptor in this case, uh, by Flanagan, who, who represents Monsieur César Côté, but uh, in a very different way. He, mo he looks more childish uh, in the sculpture than in the self-image he wants to give of him. Uh, and uh, th this is, again, our theme of uh, the confrontation between, let's see, what could be real about him and what the, the self-image he wants to give of himself. If we go a little bit further in time and closer to us, I have here an example of uh, a portrait of a painter who has considerable interest, who is called Osias Le Duc. Uh, Le Duc was the teacher of uh, Paul-Emile Bordua, so it gives you an idea of uh, who this guy was. He was living in Saint-Hilaire, I mean, uh, near Montreal here, maybe 30, 40 kilometers from here, and uh, made most of his career was painting in decoration of churches, let's say. What Le Duc did for a living was a church decorator. Uh, you have even in Notre Dame uh, Church here in Montreal, in the old part of Montreal, you have, just when you enter on the right, you have a baptistery there where some of his pictures are, if you want to see a Le Duc uh, nearby. And um, the other thing is he made some portrait also, some fantastic still life. Uh, we have here in this museum a few examples of that. W you could look at them for hours before really uh, understanding all their intricacy and all that. It is a fantastic trompe l'oeil type of, of painter also. Here he makes his own portrait, and he called it My Portrait, uh, and it's based probably on a drawing, uh, a charcoal drawing that I put uh, in parallel there, where it's very much close to the kind of northern uh, tradition in which the artist is seen, if you think of Friedrich, for instance, if you think uh, of Munch, uh, or even closer to us of Van Gogh or, or Mondrian, where the artist is seen as somebody who is more intense than we are, uh, that have a certain uh, inner vision that make him see things that the common uh, people don't see. Uh. And this is a little bit what he wants to convey. Uh, the uh, uh, he doesn't show him himself in, 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 in uh, the action of painting, for instance. There's no palette, no studio there, nothing. It's him more like a creator of, of uh, emotional perception of the world or even of ideas. He, he says himself, I'm an annonciateur d'idées. Huh? I, 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 uh, ideas are bigger. I don't know what to translate that. Annoncier, ça veut dire annoncer. Huh? I'm... I'm uh, proposing new ideas, let's say. So he sees himself as not so much somebody who copy nature, but on somebody who have a perception of nature who is symbolical and in which you will have more content than what, what the high sees. Huh? And there is another picture of Le Duc who seems more bourgeois, a little bit more 
more because of the, uh, the bow tie, of course, uh, right away. This is give you a, an idea. And, and there may be a suggestion of the studio. If you look behind him, you have these little square on a, on a kind of shelves there, and probably this is the, uh, uh, the a little bit, a suggestion of painting in a studio. But this is rare. Habitually, Le Duc doesn't show that. He shows himself as a, uh, in control, like more a man of ideas and all that, and not at all uh, like, uh, 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 let's see, somebody who executes paintings. No. Okay, I go a little bit further in time, closer to us, with this picture of uh, Old Gate. We Edwin Holgate. Uh, we had recently here in this museum, and it's now circulating all over Canada, um, uh, quite a nice retrospective of Holgate, in which you saw most of his painting. It, it was a little bit a forgotten painter, I would say, before that retrospective, uh, because he's contemporary of the avant-garde, and, and obviously he was not part of it directly. Mind you, he was uh, teaching in Ecole des Beaux-Arts, also in the museum, and he had influenced a lot of, of young, younger artists than him. Huh? And everybody speaks of Old Gate as a very nice man, very completely bilingual also, could, could speak French with, with a French student, all that. And he, he have left certainly a very nice memory, but as a painter, he seems more restrained, a little bit more, let's see, this picture of 1934, which, seems to be very realistic and all that, and, and think of it, in 34, the surrealism is already full blown uh, and things. But no, he, he kept this kind of more traditional type of painting, maybe influenced by Cezanne a little bit, uh, maybe there's an opening on, on Cezanne type of picture. And here, again, we are confronted to uh, an image of a painter which uh, doesn't give us much clue about his uh, real craft, if you want, except that on the right side, there is a kind of a nude there on the wall that looks uh, a little bit like some of the engraving he made. Mind you, it's not exactly this engraving, since if you compare both, they are not uh, situated in the same direction, but it's uh, in the style of, I think. So. And that will explain also why the nude behind him is in gray, black, and white. Uh, maybe he's, he's alluding to his, uh, his, one of the aspects of his career was to be an engraver. Uh, so that, that could be like in my Poussin picture that, you show, that I showed before, a suggestion of his uh, a real uh, occupation, let's say as a painter or an engraver, by putting one of his work behind him. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the relation then of the self-portrait with other self-portrait, let's say, in the history of modern art, become more and more complicated and intricated because uh, you could say that these painters cannot ignore the tradition. Huh? It's too present, there's too much uh, going uh, around, and they are aware, of course, of it, and so they are in dialogue, I would say, with this tradition. For instance, uh, uh, Rosalind Peppel, who was the uh, the curator of that show, of Olgate show, I've suggested a relationship between this picture and Cezanne, wi which is a good idea. Huh? Uh, Cezanne, of course, I've made a lot of self-portrait, and uh, here it's uh, a little bit curious with a white cap. You will see why he put that. And uh, where his look is very neutral, it's very hard to understand what he's feeling exactly, as if he was uh, looking at himself and, and depicting almost uh, himself from outside. He, he's told, uh, I don't know if it's true, but there's so many stories uh, about Cezanne. He's told that when he was painting his wife, he was shouting at her from time to time, ne bougez pas plus qu'une pomme. Huh? <laughs> don't move more than an apple. Uh, okay, well, which is not nice, of course, to tell to your wife, but, uh, but, but this is a little bit what what you feel here, say that the ne bougez pas plus qu'une pomme, say, uh, and to, to represent himself like this from outside. The white cap is probably an allusion to one painter for whom he had uh, a lot of admiration. It's uh, Chardin, uh, in which also Chardin represents himself like this or with a visor on the left or with this kind of white cap like this. Uh. And, and that's what I, I was uh, mentioning before, that this kind of dialogue that you see from one self-portrait to the other, where the, the, the portrait try to, uh, to uh, where the, let's say the artist tried to situate himself in this. And you remember in the Old Gate portrait, 
a self-portrait I'll show you, he have a scarf around his neck, like here. Uh, and uh, so th this is not, you would say, well, it's not conscious, the guy didn't think of it, he's just a crazy art historian who see these things and all. But, but, but I'm not sure. I'm sure that rather there's a kind of dialogue between, uh, with the tradition, especially that these pictures are not obscure or difficult to see. They are in the Louvre uh, and they are reproduced everywhere. So uh, that uh, a man like Holgate uh, certainly have known that, have, have, have access to a reproduction of that and could play with these kind of allusion and left us, of course, to discover them and to try to understand them. Uh, after Holgate, of course, the, uh, the two uh, heroes of the avant-garde, let's say, will be uh, Paul-Emile Bordua and Alfred Pellin. Uh, uh, the Bordua painting that you have, it's a very small little thing. Huh? You don't imagine a huge painting. It's a small thing. The date of it is very, I've been uh, the object of endless discussion. The only thing that make me think that 1928 is, is the exact date because it's not written on the picture, of course, nor in the back of it. Uh, it's just, it is that it has been reproduced in the first article that was written about Bordua with this date uh, in 34. So you could say, well, uh, Bordua was there, uh, the uh, Maurice Gagnon who wrote this article, who happens to be my father, so he's, in, he's with God now, so he will not uh, intervene. And uh, <laughs> if I say some sotis, Anyway, uh, the, uh, Gagnon knew Bordeaux directly and uh, he could have asked him what is the date of this picture and why 1928 would it be a date that Bordeaux will remember. It is the date when he graduated from School of Fine Arts. And there is indeed at the time in the newspaper a picture of him who looks very much like, like he is now. You know that Bordeaux later will be completely bald but there he still have a little hope of some hairs, you see. And it's exactly like in the picture when he was graduating in 1928. So I guess this is a, a good indication of the date. But um, what he shows there is of course, uh, if you think of his, ma of his uh, uh, teacher, who was Ozzy Le Duc, who's like a, um, almost a wizard uh, and all that very uh, restrained and all that, he show himself more like uh, rebellious a little bit, uh, no ties, uh, open open the uh, collar and be behind him a piece of probably a quilt that he had all his life in uh, we see it in many photos uh, with the kind of motif in uh, in, Los in losange in diamond diamond shaped motif uh, behind him so uh, a little bit uh, art populaire also uh. the uh, the charcoal of pelin uh, of uh, 33 35 uh, this was done in when pelin was in paris uh, you know that Pelin spent almost 14 years in Paris and came back to uh, Montreal in 1940 when the war started really and it was no more easy f for him to, to survive there. And to so he, uh, he stayed but a l long, long time, very curious man, uh, meeting uh, like the, the, the Paris of avant-guerre, of course, is a wonderful place to be. It's, uh, you could speak with uh, Breton, with uh, Picasso, with whatever. Th th these people were, because of this wonderful institution of the cafe, uh, you sit outside and uh, if you are a little bit clever, you recognize this great man, you sit nearby and the day after you sit a little bit closer and finally you speak to them. And uh, so we don't have this here because it's too cold, the uh, <laughs> cafe <laughs> will not work. And uh, that's why also philosophy was invented in Greece, huh? because <laughs> in Canada there's no way to invent philosophy. We, <laughs> we'll be <laughs> we, have a, we need a place where you can walk and speak. Anyway, so Pellin wa was in Paris at the time, and he, uh, he presented himself in the contrary, like uh, very sure of himself. And he, there's certain anxiety in the look of Bordeaux, but not in Pellin. Pellin sure himself. And in, at the time, he was associated to a group who's called Force Nouvelle, uh, New Strengths. Uh, and it's a group of um, rather obscure painter now, but who wanted to go back to realism and to, to be against the uh, abstract current and all that. And Pellin pre present himself in a realistic way. Yeah. And now, better way to finish this presentation than by this picture of Alex Colville. Yeah. Colville never made a self-portrait all his career. And uh, he did that finally in this one and one case only. 
And as habitual, as usual with Colville, it's a complex picture. Of course, the first thing we notice is this damn gun on the <laughs> on front of him uh, on the table. He, he is in his studio there. So you have to, to uh, for, for a painter, this is a really clean studio. Huh? The, I, I, I don't know if you ever saw the studio of uh, Guido Molinari, for instance. Very dirty, it's incredible. When you think of Molinari picture, you expect it, that he will work in this environment. It's not true at all. But Colville, yes, Colville is a third floor of his, of his uh, home. And uh, what he have in front of him is, is a target pistol. In fact, it's not, nothing to do with, the, with death and suicide and things like that. Because a target pistol, it's a thing where you check your uh, control, in fact. Eh? And uh, murder and suicide, so you lack control. Eh? So, uh, and he, he likes to, to play with these things. He, he had a career also as a soldier before and all that. So he, he, he liked this idea of a gun. He presents himself certainly in front of a mirror. And the clue, it is, look at this finger, and you will see his uh, ring on the, on the wrong hand. <laughs> Normally, you, you wear the ring on, uh, on the left, and now it, it shifts on the right. And of course, if you look at yourself in the mirror, you have this inversion uh, that will take. So we are sure that in this case, he didn't use photograph, but he used a rather uh, he hide also partly his mouth because, like he says, he says uh, a painting, if you could say in words what the painting is all about, you don't need to paint it. Huh? It's like Louis Armstrong, he says about his, his music, if you don't get it listening to it, there's no way I can explain it to you. <laughs> huh? And uh, which is true, it's, uh, if, if you don't reach it that way. So he hide a little partly his mouth look at himself like this with intensity, and of course, uh, the mirror and all that make, uh, and he says that, he says, maybe I'm allowed after all this, uh, this long life to have uh, a little boot of narcissism, uh, of looking at myself in a mirror. And uh, narcissism, in fact, is, it's exactly that. It is, here I, I show it in a picture of Caravaggio, uh, looking at his own image, uh, and uh, being so immersed in it, that finally uh, he died. He finally, he, he, the image become reality and he disappear in the image it, itself. And also abolish whatever is around him, uh, including this poor nymph that, that was in love with him, who's called Eco, and who, who disappeared also from, from his concern. Uh. So narcissism, in fact, is also re, uh, recall us that mirror could be a kind of symbol of death also. Uh. And uh, in the mirror, you catch your soul, but also you can lose it. Uh, and uh, the best illustration of that I saw, uh, it's in the uh, Guy Maupassant uh, uh, short stories, it's called Le Horla. I don't know if you read this, but uh, you, could, you could read it, I'm sure it's translated, there's no problem. In which uh, you, you, the man describes suddenly that he's looking uh, at a mirror, at his own image, and suddenly the, the mirror is empty. He doesn't see himself anymore. And how troubling this is thing. Say, then you are in front of a mirror, and then suddenly the image disappears completely and just come back slowly. Huh? And as if precisely the image can catch your soul, can, can remove it from you. And we are told that psychotic patients very often look at themselves in mirror to do exactly the opposite. They lost their soul, they try to find it in their own image. Huh? So there is a relation there between mirror and death. And uh, it's, it's uh, curious to finish with that because we begin by the mirror, by the problem of the mirror. But I think this was implied in all this adventure of the self-portrait. Uh, so the conclusion it is that there's a lot of illusion that created by the self-portrait. It's not the best way to enter in the, uh, tamper, in the character of the painter uh, because they, they lie about themselves or unconsciously or consciously, uh, it's not important. They give an image of himself, sometimes a social image, what they want us to believe, how devoted to their heart they are, or sometimes also an aggressive image or very sure of themselves image who, who correspond more or less to what they are. Uh. So there is certainly this aspect of meconnaissance of uh, unknowledge, if you want, in a self-portrait that we will not find in the portrait that we will deal with uh, after. Uh, when in the, the other lecture I will give, 
we will not deal anymore with self-portrait, we will deal with portrait of other people, and then indeed the painter could be closer to the truth that when he make his own self-portrait. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, this is not like uh, in classroom.